Welcome to In An Instant, my name is Ben, and today I am here at The Mothership in Enschede in the Netherlands. We are touring the Polaroid factory, really the beating heart of Polaroid, and I cannot wait to see how everything works in here. We're gonna to talk to some amazing experts in there, some of whom who have been with the Polaroid company since long before they transitioned to the Impossible Project, some fresh faces, seeing how these generations work together to make this magical film happen. Without further ado, Let's go inside. The kind of photography that would become part of the human being. Press a button and have the picture. It's a pull door. <laughs> this is the last remaining original Polaroid factory in the world. For most of the 20th century, Polaroid ballooned as an international multi-billion dollar corporation with headquarters in Cambridge, Massachusetts, producing millions upon millions of film packs and camera units that supplied the world with the genius invention of instant film. As the 21st century wrought the destruction of analog photographic industries, Polaroid went bankrupt, and its assets were sold off or destroyed in the process. In 2008, on the brink of the final blow to Polaroid film's existence, the Impossible Project formed as a new company to rescue the remaining machinery and configure it in one of Enskede's Polaroid manufacturing facilities. Here, they had to reformulate the unthinkably complicated chemistry of instant film, and over the last 15 years, they have brought the wonder of Polaroid back to life. This used to be six or seven buildings all around, pumping out huge, huge, huge numbers of Polaroid film. Then it all got shuttered down. Those other buildings all got decommissioned, and when Impossible Project came in, and the guys bought the remaining kind of machines, because they actually bought the machines not even the building, they got this one. And, yeah. it was, and it was already half dismantled, right? So oh. this was the last place where you could have a chance to make it, but sure. you still needed to put it a lot of work in. And that's exactly what, what they did, and then we continued doing, and now we modernized and kind of turned the ignition on the other machines. Because right. it started with just two, and I think now we're running like eight. So it's been, uh, it's been a journey. But yeah, this is a special place. This is the heart and soul of the whole operation. This is where we make the film. We will be moving through the Polaroid factory in a somewhat linear fashion, starting with the raw materials of a Polaroid film unit, then toward paste formulation, negative cutting, assembly and finishing, the lab, and other unique stops along the way. Hi. 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 Hi, how you doing? Hi. Howdy. Hi. My goal today is to say howdy or hello to every single person that I cross paths with. So this is our main warehouse, Ben. This is where we keep all of the various components required for film manufacturing. All the materials that come from our plant in Monheim, and then all the other materials that are required to make the film here in Enschede. Yeah. And Monheim is doing what? Monheim does the coat and the material. It's a good example here. This is a roll of positive, so the transparent layer that you see on the film. Yeah. Uh, Monheim coats basically two products for us: the negative and the positive. The negative is done in complete darkness, of course. Yeah. yeah. From the minute it's first coated there till it actually gets used by the customer. So these rolls come in more than a thousand meters, one thousand to two thousand meters of material on it. We'll convert these rolls here, and I'll show you upstairs later right. to the required format for the film. I mean, we've got automated robots yeah, shifting most, film around. This is the most modern thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, you got an I one with a little phone situation here? Yeah. <laughs> kind of mocked it up. Yeah, I mean that's, that's pretty elite. Point. Yeah, that, that's pretty great. So, what is happening in this room? Yeah, this is what we call the striping operation. This is where this red stripe is applied to the foil that actually holds the developer paste. Okay. And the whole function of this red stripe is it's kind of a glue layer that needs to stay shut for the whole lifetime of the pod, mm. but needs to open in a very specific way right. when the photo ejects from the camera. So we dye it red so that we can see where it is, and later we slit the material down to size and none of the pod elements have to be done in the dark, right? Only the negative layer? Correct, yeah. Okay. So this is the pod foil. It's a complex, multi-layered laminate structure. This gets fed through the machine. We'll go underneath these rollers that will apply these red stripes. And then later we'll cut this material down to size that will get folded up and eventually will contain a developing paste. But there's a lot of like very specified machinery here, obviously. Absolutely. Is that aspect a huge challenge for you? Yeah, like, absolutely. I mean, this machine is unique. There yeah. only exists one in the world. I believe the Polaroid Corporation tried to outsource its operation and failed miserably, brought it back in house. So it looks like a very, very simple machine, but very, very complex, very exact specifications. There only exists one. 
we had no spare parts, very little technical documentation. And to future proof this, this has been one of our key focus areas. Really? Yeah. The reason I brought you all here is because we've gotten our first mirror selfie moment of the factory tour, and it's inside this very unique room. And let's just go ahead and take a selfie. Obviously, uh, you know, not everyone can have the Ben F lab coat, but these are pretty cool. These are Polaroid Originals lab coats. Yep, yep, yep. These are nice. All right. Walked out of there with one of these. Bob, what are you doing in there? We are making from different uh, chemicals, we make pasta. How long have you been here doing that? Uh, yeah, eight years. Eight years? And 22 years by the old Polaroid. Okay, so you're, a, you're an original member yes. of this. All right, let's check it out. Yeah, okay. Come. Bob. She has a recipe. Yeah. And then she weighs all the chemicals uh, in the bags. Mm -hmm. And then we start with water. Yeah. And then uh, other chemicals. And that must turn uh, one hour, and then another chemical about eight hours. Eight hours. Eight hours. How much? How much film? Like the equivalent of material. That depends on the recipe. Okay. How, how much kilo uh, right. we must make. Okay. But this is like a large batch. No. No. This is a small one. This is a small one. That one is uh, bigger. When I die, can you throw me in that? I would love to be used as part of a pod. At the end, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At the end. <laughs> So I've noticed that there's a, a generation of different kinds of people here. There's some yes. young employees. Yeah. Some have been here since That's the original days. Huh? It's great. It's I mean, great. I feel like yeah. the mixing of yeah. generational information. And, and we all uh, love pop Polaroid. Right. Yeah. So who is this? Let's let's this meet. This is Tiffany. Tiffany? Yeah. I'm, I'm Tiffany, here. nice to meet you. So Tiffany, what what's going on over here? What are you doing? Well, I'm preparing a recipe. I'm uh, weighing down all the chemicals. To yep. uh, prepare it for the reactor. So this is the entire component of the pods is what's happening here? Yeah, this is the base. Yeah. This is where it all starts. Yeah. What's your favorite part about working here versus... And it's just the whole vibe. It's uh, weird. I, I feel like I'm here with my family instead of co-workers. Yeah. This is really, it's really nice. And we were just talking with Bob about how there's like different generations of people that work here. Yeah, we have like the, the, the older generation. They have so much to teach us. It's just really interesting. It's like the, the machinery, these are like twice as, as old as me. That's like insane to work with. It's absolutely That's, wild. It's a piece of technology which I, I really appreciate yeah. more than the normal stuff we have these days. Was your background whatsoever in photography? Had you ever shot a Polaroid before you started working uh, here? No, <laughs> no, no, I have no experience with Polaroid before I got here. Wow. No, and it's, uh, I just got lucky. I left school and um, it was like, yeah, we have a job for you. Let's try it. And I never left. Wow. Put those Let's on. Uh, my friend. <laughs> Whoa. So when I first started, the training was just watching your videos. <laughs> That's insane. That is absolutely outrageous. I would say, oh, you've got a really good Polaroid knowledge. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's me. That's all. I arrived at that one independently. Yeah, 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 sure. That was just your personal <laughs> research. and <laughs> My personal research yeah. that you happened to collate. Oh, my gosh. This is exactly what I needed to hear today. <laughs> oh, my goodness. OK. What have we got here? Yeah, this is what we call the negative slitter. We purchased this machine in the Impossible Project days. Um, we found it in the middle of nowhere somewhere without instructions. Uh, we found two retirees who actually uh, operated the machine. They came here a couple of times to build the machine. It took us, I think, over a year and a half to get it operational. So basically, this room is normally in complete darkness. We take the big base rolls of negative that we make in our Monheim factory. It gets fed into the machine. And on this side, there's a load of knives very specific distances that slit the material down to the required size to use it upstairs in the film assembly. So this was obviously a huge get. This probably increased efficiency dramatically. When, when, when was this machine acquired? I think we purchased this three years ago. It was in, in the middle of the pandemic. But now this is a, definitely a big efficiency increase for us, but also future proofing. So this machine was not built for this purpose? No. So, no, what was it retrofitted from a different yeah, setting it's, machine? It's built to convey materials like paper and other things. Oh, okay. But obviously, what we do is very unique. Sure. Because we say, yeah, we like your machines, we want to cut this unique material, but we want to do it in the dark. Right. So, well, hang on a minute, then you can have no lights on it, then you've got to. Yeah, right, right, right. You can't right. have sensors on it with a light on it. it it's, yeah. it's very specific requirements. 
So what the guys will do now is show you what it is like in complete darkness. We'll close all the doors, we'll dim the lights, we'll give you a pair of really cool night vision goggles, and you will experience what these guys do every day. Okay, so what are these, what is this device? Um, yeah, it's a digital night vision goggles. Um, yeah, so um, we, you can see there's no normal light in the room, but once we uh, put the room into dark mode, uh, the normal light is dimming okay. and the uh, infrared light is right. going on. So with these goggles, you can see in the dark. Because and the, the, the film isn't sensitive to infrared, obviously. That's, no. that's sort of the, the idea here. Yeah, yeah. So we can operate the machine in the dark yeah. with these goggles. Well, let, let's check it out. Okay. What do I have to do? You need to. Put I currently it on. can't see anything. No, because it's not on yet. Oh, whoa. Now it's. Holy cow. What the hell? Does this have autofocus? It's, it's, it's sort of like seeing in black and white. Um, skin tones look uh, scary. It uh, feels like I'm in sort of a found footage horror film, uh, but I imagine that things will improve drastically once the. or get even worse when the lights turn off, so. We're gonna dim the lights and the room will get into the dark mode. So, this is a switch here and uh, it will close all the doors automatically. So, how long did it take you to get used to seeing like this? Uh, about a week. A week, okay. Yeah, because um, there's a, sl a small delay. Yeah. Uh, because it's a digital. Film. Yeah, there's like a latency that's yeah. a little disorienting. Yeah, so it's like three milliseconds or something. Yeah. It's. Uh, it's just yeah. enough for the neural pathways to yeah. feel like this isn't correct. Yeah, I always describe it like it's, uh, you're being drunk. Yeah, it yeah. feels like I'm blackout drunk. Yeah, really. Now it's completely dark in here. Oh, it is? Oh my god. <laughs> I literally did so not I, sense that. And you can see all the uh, light, yeah. the infrared lights are shining down to the machine, so we st can still uh, operate the machine, but the light won't affect our material. This is really gorgeous. Seeing the specified machinery that goes into every single element of the process just like makes you think about how difficult it is to, to produce this stuff and, and to produce the machinery that goes along with it um, and how limited these are. The fact that they only have two of these machines to pump out film across the world with the negatives. Let's ask a little bit more about this. So why don't you come on in here. Um, so what, what was like the major difference you found in operating the machine from the 70s and like a brand new piece of tech. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, this one is computer programmed, so everything uh, we need to uh, put in a computer. And with the old machine, everything we did was manual. Right, right, right. You have to become a computer programmer in order to fix this versus the yeah. other thing is more mechanical. Yeah, we're glad to have it uh, because our production is going way up right, right. With, with the old machine. And uh, the quality of the material is also so much better. Really? But, yeah, the cutting is so much better than the old machine. So it's, it's nice to see that there's like new mechanical technology entering the factory. Because I think there's like an assumption that a lot of the machines are just old and they're going to break down. And, yeah. But this shows that there's like new stuff coming yeah. here. And yeah, and we also ordered two more. So what? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, the one from, uh, for the post positive material. Yeah. Slip sheet and one for the uh, for the portfolio sheet. Okay, more slitters to come. Yeah. All right. Thanks for showing us around. Yeah. No problem. The next stop on your Polaroid journey is where film is finally assembled. Please watch the gap between the elevator and the platform. ASMR Polaroid elevator 4K. Music uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we need some music for that sequence. When we were downstairs, we looked at the pod foil with the red stripe on it. Yep. This has now been cut down the slitter machine to the very specific size that's required. And basically speaking, this material will end up getting folded yep. and it will get filled up with developer paste. So the rolls are getting fed into the machine. Yep. This whole kind of package is getting pulled through. The needle here is laying in the underside of the pod foil. There you can see that. There. Yep. Yep. That's injecting the paste. It's basically like a, like a sausage, let's say. And then it goes through all these various blocks that seals it. So the paste gets squeezed to one side, the seals come together, and the pot gets laminated. Here it's on that knife, little knife that's getting cut off. And 
and basically there's a pop. So here we have Polaroid Go pods, just baby pods. So when when a film uh, like develops a little bit improperly, you see three streaks. Yep. What what is causing that? Yeah, it's sure, but you can see with a square format pod. This looks like this. Okay. It's got compartments in it. Yep. These compartments influence the the kind of wave of yeah. how the paste spreads. If one of these compartments has failed, you may get then a defect in it. You may I get a, a streak here. Okay. So maybe the seal will open, the paste will oxidize a little bit, and then it won't function as it should. What's the purpose of having three sections for the pods? Because you manipulate how the it spreads like a wave, basically. Yeah. So here we are. I mean, we spread some paste out in a wave form. If you didn't have these, yeah, you'd get a particular wave shape. This is to manipulate it to be able to force paste into the corners. Okay. In this case, 1,100 milligrams of paste. So we have those huge reactions downstairs, 600, 800 kilos of paste. Yeah. That eventually ends up getting pumped out into these 50 gallon drums. Yeah. We use Imperial here. <laughs> and then that 50 gallon drum eventually ends up as that tiny, tiny, tiny amount of paste in each film. Wow. So the big reactors downstairs, 800,000 unique memories, basically, per reactor. So, so when they're all done, the pots will then go into the trays. We saw these downstairs. Yeah. And then these trays get loaded into these cars, and then we'll take them to the assembly machine. Okay. So now we'll go to the molding where we make the black plastic cassettes. Whoa, nice sign. My, the first large sign we've gotten during this experience. You wanna buy it? I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, can I get one or? Well, we need to replace it, right? Oh, we, well, we yes you do. I guess, <laughs> I mean, I'll take it off your hands. <laughs> this is really a different kind of experience up here. A lot more people, a lot more action, a lot more noise. This is where you can really feel like everything's coming together. This is the molded operation. This is where we make the black plastic cassette. Like everything we do here, very complex. You sure. Yeah, it's black plastic, but our plastic that we use is, is made in a very specific way to be light tight. Mm -hmm. You think all black plastic is light tight, but it isn't. So it starts life as a granule. That's in this big hopper here. The granules get sucked out. So what is, it, what is a granule that's... Oh, oh I see. So it all starts with just many of these. Yep, little black plastic chips. They'll go via this extraction system. We'll end up in a hopper of one of the molding machines. Shove it into this hopper here. It's getting heated up till yeah. it becomes liquid. Yeah. And it's getting injected into the mold cavity, then cooled very quickly. I see. And then that's the product. And why, why did some get dumped through here? And I think the initial ones that you start off are not completely filled. Okay. The mold needs to be up to temperature. The beauty of this stuff is we actually have 100% yield. So we'll take these, put them in these bins, yeah. we'll re-grind it back to granules, and then we can reuse wow. them. Wow, okay. These are actually from the original Polaroid days. <laughs> so they have seen probably billions of cassettes. Yeah. And so this is a major moment for distinguishing I-type and yeah, 600. Yes, but originally the molds, I said, they're from the original Polaroid days. Right. When it was only 600. Yeah. So we've modified these molds to make I-type. I see. So basically this cavity now, like I said, the liquid material is coming in. It's getting injected into it. It's getting cooled down. Mold opens up. Products are dropping out at the bottom. Still warm. Yep. Woo! Like a baker. Oh Press my gosh. <laughs> Feeling a warm cassette is... It's, it hits different. It doesn't get any fresher. It doesn't than get that. any fresher than this. <laughs> oh, the smell. Oh my gosh. So you had to, when you were producing Go film for the first time, can create a completely different mold, obviously. Yeah, we had to buy a new molding machine. We had to create new molds. We had to develop a cassette. I mean, Extremely expensive oh, undertaking, yeah. yeah. So all these cassettes are now coming along the conveyor. This is a quality scanner, so it'll scan the cassette to make sure there's no defects in it, that all the plastic is complete. When it's all done, the cassette will go into this conveyor system, and then it goes into this kind of super highway oh and feeds God. all of the individual assembly machines. The moving and grooving up here is intense. We're just tossing cartridges. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously the scale of production is much smaller, but... Um, how hard has it been to grow within this one factory? It's been a huge challenge. I mean, basically, these machines were here yeah. in various states, right? I mean, yeah. it wasn't, Polaroid didn't leave it in a, sure. in a turnkey kind yeah. of situation. So it's been a big challenge to get the machines robust, maintained again. Polaroid stopped maintaining over the years. 
But obviously a retiring population, a lack of skill, sure. a lack of technical documentation, a lack of parts, yeah. you name it. Right, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think when we first started, 100,000 packs in a year. My first year, 2014, we did three quarters of a million. Yeah. But this year we're going to do 10 million. I mean, it's a massive, yeah. massive... Uh, I think what's, what's really interesting about Polaroid's positioning as a manufacturer of film is that you look at Kodak, for example, massive scale, having trouble scaling backwards, Polaroid started restarting in this factory. Do you feel you were much better positioned to like scale with the market right now? Yeah, I mean, we can keep growing. We've yeah, got yeah, a lot yeah. more capacity in hand. Right? Okay. We don't utilize it yet. Um, we just recently started working in shifts, for example. Yeah. We could roll it out further. Um, but obviously, you know, it's um, we've got to grow incrementally. We've got to do it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We've got to get that operational excellence. So. Hi, how you doing? Hello. Fine. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> right. So this is the film assembly machine. This is where it all comes together. All the components and everything we've seen so far comes here. The machines made in the U.S., engineered in the 60s, installed in Enschede in the early 70s. So here we're seeing what we call the web section. This is the mask material. This is the frame you see on the film. Yep. Later it could be cut out to a round frame, could be a colored version. Here's the positive. We saw downstairs, this is made in Monheim, coated with six layers of different chemicals mm -hmm. simultaneously. And these materials are getting fed into the machine. Basically what this does is it ensures continual running. So when one roll runs out, the materials will get spliced together, and then the second roll will then feed into the machine. All of these are going in this way. Yeah. The negative we saw downstairs that you saw in the slitter yeah. room with the guys, that obviously is done here in complete darkness. It'll get loaded on. Now basically all the materials that we've seen, the positive, the negative, and the mask, will get pulled through here, and each one of these stations performs a different operation. This applies something we call a rail, that's that little black mm -hmm. stripe. Uh, here is where you ask the question about where is the cutout done? That's done here. Okay. So it's punched out of the mask. Yep. And then basically each one of these stations, you can see the film and assembly here. Mm. It goes through various operations. Is anyone in, in this laminated. room, or there, there's no reason for a human being to be back here? Not normally. Because I, I noticed that it's not very like. No, no, no. <laughs> no not... When the machine's running, no need to be in it. Sure. If there is a problem with the machine, the guys will come in here and troubleshoot. Mm. These guys will do it without night vision goggles. For them, this is it's too small. It's that kind of problem you have with seeing depth. Oh. It's much easier for them. They come in here and they. It's funny to watch them. They come <laughs> in here and they can feel. They know exactly where things are. Depress it. They'll debug the machine. They'll unjam it. They really don't like turning the lights on. They'll do anything. To well, I'm to sorry we violated their <laughs> code, but you know we yeah. had to see it. This machine is in maintenance now. So <laughs> okay, this machine's in maintenance. We're not doing anything bad. And inside the machine is operating in complete darkness, of course. Right, right. Basically, every half a second, a Polaroid frame is moving along. It's going through various stations, laminating it, folding it, cutting it, everything else. It is pod assembly, and, and is that happening here? Yeah, and here we got the pods. There's the parts of the trays we saw. They go in, you can actually see them moving. They go in one at a time into the assembly machine. Sheesh. So this is really like the the major moment here. This, oh, is, this like, is where it happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah this yeah. is where it happens. Yeah. So that sort of beat you can hear that dun, 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 that's every half second there's a Polaroid frame moving along. So how many how many like sequencing machines do you have for this? Uh, film assembly machines, we've got eight operational. Okay. This one next to us is the the last of its kind. This has been a donor machine for years. Wow. In theory, we could reanimate this one. Sure, sure. In theory. We must reanimate him. <laughs> so when you produce something like round frame yeah. or a color frame, yeah. it requires the full focus of one machine. Yeah, we will produce it dedicated on one machine. In theory, every machine can produce everything. Yeah. With a couple of, a couple of minor differences. But if we want a round frame, then we need to put a round cutting die on. We want to produce a colored frame, we need to put a different mass material on. Uh, I type to 600, we need to convert the machine. Right. So the machines can make all the film formats in, in all of the special editions, but yeah. it requires some conversion. I imagine a major component of uh, scheduling is figuring out how much output you need for each film type uh, and absolutely. like when to squeeze in you no, know, a special edition. I mean, when, when you look at like what Vim and his team do, they'll take the negative and the sheet and the paste, and that's like a recipe that every time is unique. Yeah. So they've got to try and match that. They've got to match it into an economical quantity. Mm -hmm. Then we need to make sure it's an economical quantity for production. 
not too often changeovers. Yeah. And then people ask us, yeah, why don't you do more of that film? Yeah, then we've got to produce it in very small batches, and it needs to be a very conscious yeah. decision yeah. about how we sequence this. How do you figure that out? Do you just go based on prior special editions, and it's like this many were needed? For the market. Yeah, I mean, we get our inputs from our sales team, and yeah. we, they go to the forecasting process. That translates into a production plan, uh, and then we go with that, and we tweak it as we go. Seeing that sequence, all of that coming together, that felt like the magic moment, the real mesh point, if you will. And getting to talk to Andy about this, and Vem, having the wealth of knowledge around at all times, these are questions that I always have. There's no one to ask in New York. We all work within Polaroid work within the economy of Polaroid, cover everything there is to know about it, but then when you get here, it's like, well, you don't really, you didn't really know anything about it at all. And uh, so having the encyclopedias at our fingertips, this is a dream come true for me. And I hear a bell. Yeah, that bell is just to indicate the machine's up and running, They're about to start. So we saw the molding, the cassettes, we saw that super highway. This is the end of the super highway. So this is where all the cassettes are getting fed to the various assembly machines. And you can see them coming down the chute here. And what we see here, this example is the 600 film, sure. you can see by the cassette. So the cassette is coming down. Here we've got the batteries getting placed one at a time onto the conveyor, together with the metal spring getting placed one at a time. And then these three components are coming together into the assembly machine. On that side, the film is coming across, it is 90 degrees, eight frames will get counted out, they'll get inserted into the film pack, the film pack will continue this operation till it comes out of the front of the assembly machine. So obviously when you're producing I-type there's a modification to this process. Yeah, correct. Um, yeah, what's, what's the distinction, what do you have to do differently here? Sure, in this case we've got a 600 film so we'll put a battery in it. Yep. When we make the I-type we put a dummy card which functions also as a carrier. That will actually hold the spring in place as it gets inserted into the cassette. So you mentioned the, the eight shot per pack. I haven't yeah. brought this up yet, but what is the challenge with why can't 10 fit in? For, for people who are like, yeah, why sure. can't Polaroid sure. make a 10 shot pack? No, I mean, our film compared to Polaroid's film, the negative and sheets are much, much thicker. And you can say, yeah, what does it matter? But it's a substantial difference. Yeah. So it's just purely the physical limitation. Right. A cassette is made to fit into a 600 camera. Yeah. You can't do anything about that. Right. But the film components themselves are much thicker. If we put 10 frames in, there's a very good chance that frames will jam as they come out of sure. the camera. And there's, are you ever working on making them thinner, or you're, you're essentially just locked at eight? Maybe as an indirect consequence of our R&D, right? Yeah. I mean, we're overhauling the R&D, we're looking at how we make film, we're obviously looking at how Polaroid make film. Mm -hmm. I mean, who knows where this is? Sure. Yeah. Here's the dark slide. That's huh. what, yeah, <laughs> what everybody collects. These are pre-printed at supplier, cut down to size. They come in on these big rolls. We'll get fed through here, and they'll get chopped up into individual dark slides. Which will then go in one at a time into that chain, into the conveyor. And that will then be added to the film pack once the eight frames are inserted sure. in the pack. What is that 16 millimeter looking yeah. spool? That's actually a light feel. So when you look at a Polaroid film pack, you'll see in the cassette, you'll see a small notch. Mm -hmm. That's to help the picker in the camera to pull the picture out. This light seal is to stop light leaking in where that very little cutout is. It's pretty remarkable that the packs are light sealed. Like if you swap film from 600 to I-Type and just put this thing back in, it really shows how impressive this series of components is that it can be exposed to light. It's really unbelievable. Yeah, sure. so you can imagine something like this, as innocent as it is. If this isn't done properly, yeah. the pack is ruined. So these are the end caps. So when you put a film back in a camera, the front door opens. Mm -hmm. They're made here. They get fed one at a time, also into the assembly machine. This is our uh, high-tech uh, monitoring <laughs> station, right? So here we got various temperatures that we're looking at all the various stations, how that's controlled, what temperatures we have to laminate, seal things up. These are the counters that the assembly operators will use to see how many films we've made. These are kind of monitoring lights that will show which uh, frames have been exposed to, to light. Mm -hmm. They'll get rejected. These have been, for example, exposed to light for whatever reason, or they're defective. How does how does this machine monitor that? Sensors, there lots and lots of sensors. Okay. In there. Yeah. This we call the spiral. So when the whole pack is done, dark side's inserted, everything's done and dusted. It comes into the spiral, which is a buffer system. You can see the films going around it now. Yep. 
They will come along here, we'll get a pull tab. Hey, to it. a little sticker. That's a little pull tab yeah. to help you pull the film pack out. The pack then gets wrapped in a pouch. You can see the film packs coming along here. They'll get sealed up. There's an individual film pack. At what point was the film inserted? Was that, that was in that room? In the room, yeah. yeah. So you've got the film components coming on the left side. Yeah. You've got the spring battery and cassette coming in the back. Mm -hmm. They all get inserted and then the film pack travels this way. So it's going along here. In this case, we're making a double pack. So it's carrying two packs of film at a time. Here's how your box starts life. It's really uh, uniquely impressive how uh, every component of the packaging process happens here. Uh, it seems like something that would happen at multiple facilities, but literally looking at the boxes uh, being assembled right next to where the film is assembled, for some reason sort of caught me off guard. Uh, it's really cool. Oh my God, they're like spitting out here and spinning around. <laughs> so the packs are coming along there. Yep. The flap box is getting opened up. The packs are getting inserted. It's going along the packing machine, folding all of the flaps of the box down. And then on this conveyor here, the finished film packs are coming out. This is immensely satisfying to look oh, at. Oh, totally. Hypnotic. <laughs> yeah. Are you an ASMR guy? <laughs> this is kind of like visual ASMR. I've become one. You can see the conveyor here. Here's the finished film packs coming out. They're getting flipped up. Uh, oh, a fresh one. Okay, so we are here with Jan, correct? Yes. How, how long have you been here at Polaroid? I came here in uh, 1978. So that's five years after the introduction of the SX-70. Yeah, yeah. So you were here at the pinnacle of everything, Polaroid. Yeah. Yes. What, what is the difference between the life back then and the production now? It's uh, smaller now. Yeah. And in those days, there were two floors. This floor and beneath. Yeah. All with machines. It was, it was like a small village, you know, with uh, 1,100 employees. It was finished in 2008, and I had to, had to go, one of the last people here. Really? Yeah. So you had to leave and then come back? Yeah, and I had uh, another job. Okay. I, I for AGS, and it was finished, and then they called me, but can you come back? We need experience at the machine, because I'm, I worked uh, 35 years with this machine. Outside, inside, I know everything. He has no secret for me. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is the, what was it like coming back in the building? Like coming home. <laughs> like, it's comfortable. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, it, it was not strange. Yeah. And it was very, uh, very odd to see that I came here and some people, new people, didn't know me. But the older people know me and they, they so they had a defect in the machine and I came, I come in first time. So I said to the man, I do it. You do it, you, you, you don't know. I, I can try. So I go inside and I fix it and I call my son. How did you do that? And then I said, yes, I worked here for 30 years ago. <laughs> so. No way. This is the reclaimed blue film. You might have seen everything there is to see about this in our prior video. Um, this is the new film that Polar is producing. This is like, uh, literally, this is the Willy Wonka vibe. But a lot of people died in that movie. And I'm just passing these to Connor, who's, who's my bag man. You're my bag man. In the bag. Anything you see that is loose, just pick it up and put it in the bag. It, it takes a special kind of cursed individual to really love raw packaging. But I'm one of those people. What's this little museum? Yeah, so this is really a museum of what used to be made in the Polaroid days. Various formats, Joshua, Spectra, the peel parts. Do we, are we, does this make us sad or? We're paying respect. It's respect. We're paying respect. Yeah. We've got a lot of history here. We don't yeah. ignore it, right? Yeah. yeah, what do you say to people who are like, why can't you make pack film? Give me that in 20 seconds. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to. You'd but love to? It would take years and tens of millions. Yeah. It's, it's not just, hey, find a machine, build a machine, you can do it. Yeah. It's, it everything's possible with time and money. Sure. But, you know, it will take years and years and years of R&D and millions and millions of euros to do it. Do you think that the chemical processes that you developed, the pod system you developed, 
can any of that port over to no. a theoretical? No, it has no, to be completely. Really the if yeah, you look yeah. at our 8x10, our 8x10 has been converted to yeah. what we do here. Right. Peel apart is a totally different game. So it's That's something that people are interested in, but it's just not practical. Yeah, I mean, we love it. I mean, yeah. I think we've all got a pocket. Are you annoyed by people asking you that every day? No, it's, it's a fair <laughs> question. Yeah. You know, but I. It's, it's just not within our capability to do sure. it. Yeah. It's really sad, it's a fantastic format. And yeah. I think we'd all love to bring it back. Sure. But we've got a challenge here. Yeah, to, to absolutely. Do You're doing your own thing at capacity already, so. Since I was four or five years old, we shot Polaroid at our apartment in New York City. My family is a family of artists, and Polaroid was their way of making art accessible to me. And I've been a lover of everything instant ever since, and essentially my entire life I've wanted to see something like this, so it's pretty an, ex it's an exceptional experience. And I'm very thankful that everyone is so open and honest here. Um, no words have been minced so far. All right, so why is it so cold in here, Ben? Well, actually, I think like our film is like, like produce. Um, That's so how I've thought about yeah. it, yeah. So it's, it's, it, it, uh, it ages a bit, but then, so it's best kept in the cold to keep it fresh for longer. So it's like a huge walk-in fridge. Yeah, uh, this is the here. dream film fridge for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can have all of this <laughs> today? I can take that? Okay, cool. Damn, Oscar is gone. <laughs> Oscar is no longer on this tour. Folks, I have to show you something. Now, this room might be terrifying at first. A lot of people feel very concerned when they see what you're about to see. But in reality, this is one of the most important rooms in this building. It is where colors are tested, skin tones are tested, and uh, a sweet woman named Betsy is gonna help us explain. Come on in. Yeah. Certainly, it looks cursed in here. Betsy, so, what exactly is going on here? That's really fascinating stuff. Uh, we're getting a lot of great insight from the Polaroid staff today. Um, you can see here, these are the varieties of tests that Polaroid does on each individual batch of chemistry with all minor adjustments. And then they're using, I guess, something called a sensitometer to determine like what the values are of each of each color. And so this is kind of where the refinement process happens. I think a lot of people wonder what is going on with Polaroid. Are they improving the color? Are they making the opacification layer better? Um, you know, are they pr improving the sensitivity to temperature? This is happening here every day. I think it's very important to know that. This is an extremely complicated chemical process that's happening. Uh, I think there's an expectation of things happening overnight. No, this is like a multi-decade process that's happening. Um, so it's kind of cool, even though the room does seem somewhat cursed, uh, to, to be sort of where that happens, uh, because it's arguably one of the most important aspects of Polaroid as they shepherd their way into the future. So, thanks, Betsy. What is the room that we're in called? Right here, we are just in the lab. We call it the, the lab. lab. The lab. The lab. Yeah. This is your house of play. Yeah. This is where you're at every day. Exactly. Um, what are you doing day to day? Well, What's like your, your mission every day? My mission every day will be to try to make the customer more happy by improving <laughs> colors, um, performance, let's say temperature wise. Uh, so if people would shoot a picture outside, different type of temperatures would, the perfect yeah. thing would be that it's always the same. Also with the bright sun, uh, we want people want to shoot. When do you shoot pictures? Hot yeah, weather, when, it's, sunny when weather. it's light out. But uh, we want to make better protection from the sun because we know our, we are sometimes a little bit sensitive still. Um, yeah, and that's what I try to improve every day. And how long have you been here? This is my fifth year at Polaroid. And over those five years, how much do you think the film has improved? Greatly. I joined at like 2017, I think, 2018. And that was what we called Gen 2 and a half or Gen 3 film. Mm -hmm. and at the moment, we call it Gen 4. And yeah, I'm not a photographer myself, but I can really see improvements what they made in these years. And, and when you see like variations between batches of film, um, does that only come down to the generation of film that you're on? 
or, or are there minor variations you might see in just the machines used? Yeah, there are minor minor changes. It can be thickness, what I explained. So a thicker spreading paste layer will resolve in a more cyan picture. Right. If you have a thin layer, it will be a bit to the red side. And you have to keep in mind that every piece of negative they make like uh, kilometers long, let's say 20,000 square meters per batch. Right. So that will be all the same, but when they make a new batch, that negative will be unique. So we are fitting the wow. paste to the negative and to the sheet. So each recipe will be different from each other. Walk me through this. I, I see these all the time when, you know, yep. and we're in refining color science. Um, so these are what? Exposure tests, color tests? Yeah, I can explain you. Um, so mostly, most of the time, the pot is made by hand. Production is always sealed. You can see if it's a production pot or a handmade pot by, um, you can see the two laminations, right? The, the stripes. Yeah. So this one is a production pot. These testings are for speed measurements, gamma measurements, color balance, color gamut. We measure every every aspect of the yeah. uh, sensitom we call it sensitometry. Uh, we auto reference color balance. So typically, what we do is we take the take the positive. Do it like this, put a yep. little tape, then we take the negative in the dark, otherwise it will be exposed. Right. Put it together, like this, then it will go through two rollers and then it will be spread equally. So do you have a specialized roller machine that's intended for this purpose? Yes, we can also use different type of rollers, so we can make our left more thick paste layer or thinner, and you can see that also the color balance will shift a bit when you are thicker or thinner. So people have different cameras, so different spreading, mm -hmm. so some camera will be a little bit bigger spreading or thicker spreading than our other camera. So we are also looking at that, uh, how that affects the color balance in that way. I feel like there was a notion for some time that like the renewed interest in analog processes was some sort of like flash in the pan thing. And, no, I, and I think that now it's crystal clear to me that this is something that human beings are doing to keep in touch with humanity itself. I've been answering the question, what is this retro fad? Like, aren't you worried that this is a retro fad for 10 years? Yeah. Right? So at some point it's like, <laughs> is 10 years in a row plus whatever five years yeah. before that a fad? No, I, and I don't think it is. I think that as long as there's an experience that's sufficiently differentiated from a phone, that yeah. a phone can't do, uh, that's, that, that actually gives you some value, and I truly believe that this gives you a lot of value, then then you're good, because people are looking for these experiences. They're a little bit tired with everything working on their phone. It's amazing, sure. but it's not special. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Oscar, we'll handshake on camera. Thank you so much for being on in an instant. Thank you. Would you smash that subscribe button? Me? Well, that was an absolutely unfathomably incredible experience. Talking to these incredible people inside was truly inspirational and amazing to hear the stories and see the people that, that make this film work, this impossible dream come true. Just leaving the factory, loving this dang film more than I ever have before. While this could theoretically be the grand finale of In An Instant, I'm coming out of here feeling so stoked that I think we're gonna have to make 100 to 300 more episodes. So please stay tuned for those and thank you for watching in an instant. Go ahead and lightly tap that subscribe button with specially designed machinery. Stay tuned for more reviews, journeys, breakdowns, tips, and all things instant.